Hi everyone, welcome and today we're going to talk about A Raisin in the Sun, the next play you're reading. I want to begin our discussion with A Raisin in the Sun with a poem by Langston Hughes. He wrote this poem in 1951 and it's entitled Harlem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? So you can see why I began with this poem. The title of the play that we're gonna be looking at this week, A Raisin in the Sun, actually comes from that line in this poem. A little bit about Langston Hughes. Hughes was the first African-American author to support himself through his writing. He produced more than 60 books in his lifetime and he earned critical attention for his portrayal of realistic black characters. He also became one of the dominant voices speaking out about issues concerning black culture. He wrote in many genres. He began writing with poetry. He turned to fiction. He also wrote auto, autobiographies and children's books. Um, if you're not familiar with Langston Hughes, I really recommend that you take some time to uh, look at some of his poems or read some of his stories because he really is one of our a real national treasure and one of our great American writers. So Lorraine Hansberry, she's the author of the play that you're reading. And um, she, one of the reasons, well, let me tell you this and then I'll tell you why she's connected to um, Langston Hughes. So Lorraine Hansberry was born in Chicago on May 19th, 1930. She was the last of four children and she was born to an independent, politically active Republican uh, family, Carl and Nanny Perry Hansberry. Uh, and just to give you kind of a feel for their politics, um, hospitals were required at the time to list the racial identities of newborns. However, uh, upon receiving their daughter's birth certificate, the Hansberries crossed out the word Negro and wrote black instead. And this kind of just gives you an idea for why, uh, or just some of the ways that the Hansberries looked at their Afrocentric identity. And um, they, the, because the Hansberries were well-to-do uh, family in Chicago, they often hosted other uh, well-to-do or uh, important black figures. And that is actually how um, Lorraine Hansberry got to know Langston Hughes and became familiar with his work is that her parents introduced them uh, or introduced him to her. So although 1930 is the year that Americans most Americans associate with the Great Depression, the Hansberry's family remained economically solvent through this period. By 1930 standards, the Hansberry's were certainly upper middle class, but by the standards of most Chicago blacks, many of whom lived in abject poverty at this time, they would have been considered rich. So they really were quite a comfortable family. Hansberry was never comfortable with her rich girl kind of status among her peers and she identified better or more closely with children of the poor. Admiring the feistiness exhibited by these children um, who were so often left alone, Hansberry often tried to imitate their maturity and their independence. Um, they wore house keys around their necks, symbols of their latchkey children's status. So Hansberry decided to wear keys around her neck, any keys she might find, including skate keys, so that she could fit in with her peers. Um, in case you're not familiar with the term latchkey children, that is a, a child who goes home to an empty house. I was a latchkey children. Both of my parents worked full time when I was growing up. So when I got off the bus from school, I would go home and I had my key around my neck to unlock my door and get into my home. So that's where that term comes from if you're not familiar with it. Unfortunately, Hansberry died um, of cancer at the age of 34. 
A Raisin in the Sun, her first play, was also the first Broadway pr production written by an African-American woman and first by an African-American to win the New York Drama Critics Award, Circle Award. Although deeply committed to the African-American human rights struggle, Hensbury was not a mil militant writer. She wrote about lots of other topics. She also has another completed play called The Sign in Sidney Brewston's Window, um, another drama, Le Blanc, was adapted after her death by her husband and Broadway and Broadway producer Robert Nimroff. Um, he also compiled her writings in To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, Lorraine Hansberry in her own words, and also, which was also presented as an off-drama or as an off-Broadway play in 1969. Um, so Unfortunately for us, she died at a very young age, and we have, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, we have a very limited um, number of works from her. But she was a very intelligent, hardworking, brilliant uh, American writer. She was the first black person to win the New York Drama Critics Circle Award for Best Play of the Year, and since its release, uh, a Raisin in the Sun has been performed countless times. It's also been made into several different movies. The most recent version of it stars Felicia Rashad and uh, P. Diddy. Um, and my favorite version of it is with Sidney Poitier. Um, unfortunately, uh, I can no longer get copies of those plays, uh, videos of those uh, movies. Uh, so you won't be able to watch them. Um, if you go to your local library, you probably could check out one of those versions of the play. It's well worth watching. Um, it's definitely worth your time. It, both, pe both performances are really quite, quite good. Although she died at the age of 34, Hansberry leaves a lasting legacy as someone who refused to be silenced by limitations placed on her race and her gender. This is the dramatis personae, um, which is basically the list of characters, and it gives you kind of uh, the background of who is what. Lena Younger is the mother. She's the matriarch. She's proud, strong-willed. Um, she has deep religious beliefs, and she believes in the strength of the family. Walter Lee Younger Jr. is her oldest son. He is ambitious, he loves his family, he longs to prove that he is a man and he has, by owning his own business. Beneath the younger um, is Walter's sister. She is younger um, than Walter and she wants to be a doctor. She wants to be express it, to express herself and um, she's very interested in learning more about her African you, uh, roots. You, Ruth Younger is Walter's wife and um, the mother of his son. Uh, she wants to be what's best for her family and her dream is to move into a place with more sunlight. Travis Younger is Walter and Ruth's son. Um, he is their 10-year-old uh, boy who's energetic and their pride and their hope for their future. Asaje is uh, one of Benita's classmates, and he represents kind of the modern African American. He's very interested in cult the cultural heritage of his Nigerian people. Then there's George Murchison, who is a modern uh, African American who believes that success for African Americans will come by imitating uh, whites. And Walter uh, is very uh, critical of him and think, thinks that he is a phony because of his beliefs. The play is written in, during a period or uh, concerning a period called the Great Migration. And this happens at the turn of the century when Southern Straits succeeded in passing new constitutions and laws that disen disenfranchised most blacks and many poor whites. They were deprived of the right to vote, they could not sit on juries or run for office, and they were subject to laws passed by white legislators. 
segregated education for black children and other services were consistently underfunded in poor agricultural economies. The violence against blacks had increased while Jim Crow laws imposing segregation created more restrictions in public life. In addition, the boll weevil in infestation ruined the cotton industry in the early 20th century. Voting with their feet, blacks started migrating out of the south into the north, where they could live more freely, get their children educated, and get new jobs. And this is really the impetus for the Great Migration. All of the Jim Crow laws, all of the things that were going on in the South led African Americans to decide to leave the South and to move North. And that's what we call the Great Migration. Like the European rural immigrants, they had to rapidly adapt to urban culture. Um, and you can imagine living on uh, in the South um, in a farming agricultural dependent place moving to the big city is going to be quite a lot of culture shock. Uh, many took advantage of better schooling in Chicago and their children learned quickly. After 1940, however, which was, uh, there was a much larger migration, black migrants tended to already be urbanized from southern cities and towns. They were ambitious, better educated, and had more urban skills to apply to their lives. The masses of new immigrants arriving in the cities captured public attention. So there was a lot written about this great mi migration and what was going on. At one point in the 1940s, over 3,000 African Americans were arriving every week in Chicago, stepping off the trains from the South and making their ways to neighborhoods they had learned about from their friends and from reading the Chicago Defender. With Chicago's industry steadily expanding, opportunities opened up for new immigrants, including Southerners, to find work. The railroad and meatpacking industries recruited black workers. Chicago's African-American newspaper, the Chicago Defender, made the city well known to Southerners. It sent bundles of paper south on the Illinois Central trains and African-American Pullman porters would drop them off in black towns. Chicago was the most accessible northern city for African Americans in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Between, then between 1916 and 1919, 50,000 blacks came to crowd into the burgeoning black belt, make new demands upon the institutional structure of the South Side. That's the South Side of Chicago, for those of you that aren't familiar. So, what this brings to mind, or another kind of idea that I want you to think about when you're reading this play, um, we're thinking about what happens to a dream deferred. That's the title of, um, uh, or that's from the poem um, where the line, A Raisin in the Sun, comes from. And so what has happened is these thousands and thousands of African Americans have come to Chicago and they are trying to make a life for themselves. And in order to understand their needs, it's kind of, it helps to review Maslow's um, uh, discussion on self-actualization. And what this is, is we really, we start with our basic needs. So the first thing that you are concerned about as a human being is your physiological needs. Um, you have to eat, you're thirsty, your sex drives, those are your basic biological needs, okay? That's what we all do for existence. The next level or the next order of, um, uh, of importance is our needs to feel safe and secure, to live in a safe place. Um, if, you can't, if you can't eat um, or the drive to eat will outweigh your need for security. Okay, that, that's how this listing works. So once you've met your, your physical needs and you're safe, then you can start to turn your attention towards making friends, having affection, um, love in your life. Those, those are higher order needs. And when those needs are beginning to be met, then you turn your attention towards um, prestige and success. Uh, creating a career for yourself, 
um, more uh, making a name for yourself, becoming um, the person you're meant to be. And five is your self-actualization needs. And that is your ability to uh, fulfill your own unique potential. We like to refer to that as you follow your dreams. And that is the highest level of self-actualization. But what's important here to understand is that only occurs when all of these other needs have been occurred. So you have to be, um, your, your physical needs have to be taken care of, your safety needs, um, love and self-esteem. And then when all of those needs have been fulfilled, you turn your attention towards reaching your full potential. And this is really one of the themes in, um, that you'll see when you're reading A Raisin in the Sun. Um, the youngers have their basic needs met, um, and, but they want to turn towards, they've got the first three, and they're working on four and five. And so this, this play is really about their struggle to attain self-actualization, to attain, uh, obtain the American dream, which um, in, for most, uh, home, uh, most Americans today even, it is home ownership. So the theme that you will see in this play, another uh, important theme, is the American dream. So what is the American dream? Well, I just said most Americans dream of owning their own home. That, that provides a certain level of status. It certainly provides a certain level of security. It also uh, gives you the ability to leave something for your children, to have some kind of legacy to, to give to your family after you're gone. So that is the American dream. But it also involves, in order to get to that point, you have to have been able to work through all of those stages um, to reach that point of self-actualization. So what I want you to consider, um, and going back to that poem at the beginning of this lecture, is what happens when you don't get to reach your dream, or um, it's a really challenge to reach that dream, and each day that dream seems further and further away. So you have these dreams, um, you want to be a self-actualized person, however, your economic circumstances, your uh, need for safety, your need for um, food are far more important than, you know, reaching that American dream. So what does that do to a human being? What does that do to their soul? And that's really what Hansberry is trying to examine in this play is what will you go to what what are you willing to do in order to reach your personal dream so uh, if you have questions after this lecture or after reading the play or looking at any of the materials please by all means post your questions in the questions and comments discussion forum and i look forward to talking to you again soon